You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, the Kid Counselor. This is the Play Therapy Podcast where you get a master class in child-centered play therapy and practical support and application for your work with children and their families. In today's episode, I am answering a question from Terry in Ireland, and her question is about two specific clients, but more specifically about not seeing specific stages and phases in a truncated therapeutic process. In other words, not able to see them till they naturally terminate, but because of being a student, she was only given a certain number of sessions with each child. And so she's wondering what that means for the stages and phases. And she shared some specific details about two clients that I can process. So let me read a little bit of the email and then we'll talk about some thoughts together. Okay, so she mentions two clients and they are eight and 10 and mentions that there's been pretty consistent play for the first 14 sessions. And then around the 14 session mark, there was a huge turn in their play. And so some questions regarding what stage and phase, if somehow those were missed because they weren't evident, and just some different things that she wanted to process. So I'll read a little bit from the email. So the client was playing very consistently with the baby for 13 sessions and then changed the play quite a bit. At the end, it transitioned to robbers and guns and arrests and things like that. Other client was toward the end, well, toward the 13th session or so, just stopped playing and started talking. And so questions are, are they still in a stage where they are playing through their process Both appear to be in regressive stage in terms of type of play, but I have not seen any aggression. And are they being cut short because of my training circumstances? And then question number two, have I missed subtle signs? And this changes them coming out of the main work stage and moving into mastery. But that doesn't really seem right either. What I do know for sure is they were both predictably predictably playing for over 14 sessions in the way described and, and then did an about turn. It's important for you to know that I've met with parents and teachers, both demonstrated positive and negative shifts in their externalizing behaviors. One was outwardly more angry, but showing increased initiative, and one started going to bed independently, but still presenting elements of anxiety and anger. Is your brain frazzled? I shall stop there. (laughs) No, it's not frazzled, Terry. (laughs) All right. So here are some thoughts that I think we need to consider as we talk through this, because One of the outcomes, I guess maybe unexpected outcomes for me, of covering stages and phases and timeline is that therapists have really started trying to pinpoint and be really specific and figure out the stage and the phase and where we are and all of that. And so I feel like I'm actually really glad that you emailed this, Terry, because I think that this is something we need to do cautiously and carefully. So the stages and the phases are guides. They are not hard and fast rules, and they are not the same for every child, and it's not linear. So we will not ever expect a child to go one, two, three, four in order with a set amount of time and have no variations and just be able to predictably understand what's going on. That is not how the child-centered process works. So while Children go through four stages, and while they go through four phases, and while the timeline is a pretty helpful tool for us to know what we can anticipate when, children are not sardines in the same box, and therefore we cannot expect them to move and progress through therapy in that precise fashion. So I think I would encourage you all, and I said this about themes a while back, don't let themes consume you and don't spend all of your time and energy trying to figure out exactly what theme is going on and is this this theme and if they do this does that mean this theme themes are tools and guidelines so just in the same way the stages and phases are not meant to be so prescriptive that kind of goes against the child-centered way so here are some thoughts based on what you're sharing terry and i think all of us will find this helpful okay so we know 
when we do not get to complete a full course of treatment with the child, that they will process the things that they need to, but in a shorter fashion. In other words, they don't only get halfway through their stuff, they get through all of their things to a lesser degree. And so we can anticipate when you're only able to see them for 17 or 18 sessions, which that puts them right about at the halfway mark as far as the national average. If they're only getting about half of the sessions that most kids need, then everything about their play will be different because they're trying to process everything in a shorter window of time. Whereas they might actually need to work on aggressive play for 12 weeks, but they don't have 12 weeks if they're only there for 18. So they may shorten that to they only work on aggression for six or seven weeks because they know there are other things they need to address. So that naturally modifies the traditional st stages and phases because they know that they don't have as long as they would normally want to with a shortened treatment course. All right. So another thing to keep in mind, when kids are going through the stages and phases, they will sometimes skip one initially. You don't skip it ultimately, but you can skip it initially. Or you can go through a stage or a phase way too fast. The kids that are gung-ho dive in. They're just like, yeah, let's do this. And then they quickly realize, whoa, okay, this was too much, too fast, too far. I need to backpedal here. We will see that if kids skip a stage or a phase, they will naturally backtrack back to it. And sometimes kids will barely visit a stage or a phase. So we see it, but it's like a blink and then they move on to something else. But then eventually they come back to revisit those things. So I'm trying to paint the picture that just like therapy, we use the X and Y axis and we say we always are going up and right, but it's not a straight line. It's a roller coaster with loops and turns and, and twists. Similarly, we are working through these four stages and four phases, but it's not always one, two, three, four. So what we're looking to see is that there's going to be changes. There's going to be a working of all four of each, but not necessarily in that one, two, three, four order. Because sometimes kids come in and week one, they're like, okay, let's do this. And if they're older, they start telling you all of their problems, but you are essentially a stranger to them. So they did not get the warm up. They did not get the initiation. Guess what? That bites them in the butt because they divulge their whole life story to you. And then they realize, yikes, I don't even know this person. I can't believe that I told them all that. And they withdraw. It was too much too fast. It was too personal. It was too hard. It was too deep. Okay. So they completely skipped warm up and initiation. They completely skipped resistance. They were all in. Let's just start dealing with this. And eventually and inevitably they backpedal and backtrack and they still need to build a relationship with you. They still need to bond and build rapport and build trust. So what often happens is it's a three, one, three, two, three, four kind of deal. Okay, so we need to be mindful that we're never looking at these, that they have to be in order. Often they do. Often we can say, okay, we're definitely in initiation. We're definitely in resistance. And now we've made it into work. And then when we complete the process, we move into termination. Many kids do follow that format, but many kids don't. So there can't be an expectation that it's always going to be in that order because kids work at their pace, their way, their time. All right. And then here's another thought. Terry, you're describing that the baby doll had always been part of nurturing and caregiving. And then all of a sudden the baby was left alone. And then there was jail and robbing and guns and arresting, those kinds of things. That is a shift in storyline. So what we're actually looking at there is that thematically we are using a new way to process something with the same character. So you can see that the baby carries over. So we've been using baby for nurturing and caregiving. Well, baby carries over, but now thematically we've shifted, even though there's continuity in the play. 
And similarly, when you said the other client started talking, okay, that is also noteworthy because what a child says, there's always significance there. Now, your concern was that you wondered if mom told her to because it didn't feel right. And yes, that happens. So sometimes a child comes in and says, so I want to talk to you about my anxiety. And you're like, hmm, I wonder who said that to you. So sometimes, but again, it's still relevant and significant, right? Because a child brings it up because they feel they have to. That's also significant and relevant. But sometimes kids will spontaneously and organically say things. And we have to pay attention to what they're saying because it matters to them. I had a little boy yesterday. He brought his hoverboard and he's literally spinning in circles on his hoverboard in my playroom. And as he's spinning in circles, he says, yeah, we were going to go on a, a dolphin boat and my mom said that I needed to take medicine, which what he meant was like anti-nausea medicine, like if you get seasick. So he's like, my mom said that I needed to take medicine and we got there and my dad didn't know how many to give me. And then I dropped one. And so I didn't even take the number that I was supposed to. And he was like, whatever, you've had enough. And he's telling me this story. Now, could it have seemed like he was just wanting to connect with me or wanting to fill me in on what's going on outside of his life? Sometimes when kids tell you stories, that's the point. In this case, he was telling it to me because he never feels safe with his dad. His dad is not careful. His dad is not cautious. His dad is not thoughtful about the decisions that he makes. So my little boy really wanted to know that he wasn't going to get sick on the boat, but dad wasn't diligent enough to make sure that he had the right amount of medicine and that the dose was correct and that he was going to be okay. It was highly anxiety inducing for him. That's why he brought it up. So when a child starts talking about something, whether they feel compelled to or whether that just naturally emerges, there's significance there. Here's why I'm bringing those stories up. Because any change in the therapeutic process, so anything that changes, they use the same toy in a new way. The power and control shifts to a different type of power and control. We still see power and control, but it's more balanced power now versus dictatorial power. They start talking to us about something. They bring something from home. There's all of these things that take place in the process, and they're all noteworthy. So if we see any kind of resolution of something they've been working on, the theme disappears or the theme evolves into something else. Any kind of resolution is noteworthy. If there's a shift within a theme, like I just mentioned, that's also important. If they take a break from what they've been playing, they've played the same thing nine weeks in a row and they come in and they don't play it. That's significant. Or maybe they introduce a new theme completely. That's significant. So here's why I'm bringing all that up. Terry, I think this is helpful for you. It's less important to be able to accurately identify what stage and phase the child's in and more important to be able to recognize any shifts or changes or anything that is different in play. And those things that I just mentioned are some examples. Actually, and I... I couldn't have planned this if I wanted to, but, you know, divine intervention, this is how my life goes. <laughs> Yesterday, I've been playing with a little girl for, my gosh, probably three and a half years. And she is biweekly, and there's a really long story as to why I'm still seeing her, but she's actually quite stable, but there's just a lot of stuff going on with custody and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm involved in that process as well from the legal side. So there's been a lot longer of a process with her, but I'm bringing this up because yesterday is the first time that she has shifted her play in more than a year. Every single week, it's exactly the same thing. She's an animal that I find usually in the woods or a cave, but there's always this surprise discovery of a baby animal that has been left by its parents and I am the new owner and I take it to the vet and I have to play the role of the owner and the vet. So I have to switch roles depending on if we're at home or if we're at the vet's office. And I have to take care of the animal at the vet's office and I have to take care of the animal at home. And there's always a baby animal. So it, it varies from a dog, a cat, a bunny, a fox, whatever. Okay, that has been more than a year of that theme. 
yesterday, she starts with that. She says, what animal am I going to be today? And then she grabs the swords and turns the story completely into nothing I've ever seen before. She gives me swords. She has swords. She's sword fighting with me. She has special powers that no one can find out about. She doesn't tell outsiders why she's immortal. She has these secret friends that she practices sword fighting with, but I stumble upon them and then she has to fight me and she threatens to kill me because she thinks I'm going to tell her secrets. And I, I was like literally shocked in session because for a year she has played the same nurturing, caregiving type of play. And now all of a sudden, huge shift to power and control. Notice there are some similar thematic elements worked in, but notice the huge shift and there's aggression and there's power and control. Okay, that's noteworthy. My brain never once went to, oh, what stage and phase does this indicate? It went to, wow, this is such a huge shift. I'm so happy to see that she's doing something that she needs to do in here. So I hope that that's helpful for you all. Please don't get caught up in identifying the stage and the phase as a priority. It's relevant, yes. It's helpful, yes. But it doesn't always work in that chronological fashion. And that should not be the focus. The focus should be more on what's happening and why the shifts or changes are taking place. All right. So thank you so much, Terry, for the email. By the way, as I mentioned earlier, but you still have a couple of months, so some of you like to put things off, I'm aware. I'm going to be in Atlanta for the Play Therapy Conference in October. So please, please, please make plans to be there. I would love to have you all there. I know many of you have said you're going. We're going to have a huge meetup on Friday night. So even if you don't stay for the whole conference, I would just love to meet you in person. And there's going to be a ton of podcasts and collective and coaching people all there. So I'd really, really love to meet you and really looking forward to that time together. So check that out. It's in Atlanta in October. And you can get hotel rooms and tickets to the conference all in one fell swoop. Just go to APT's website and click on the conference link. All right. If you want to reach out to me, please do Brenna at the kidcounselor.com. You can also leave me a voicemail if you have a question at 813-812-5525. Love y'all. Have a great week. We'll talk again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.